This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash fireside chat. And to follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz. Seven wins in a row and the Flames are back in a good playoff spot. And as usual, I'm Dan alongside Matt, ready to talk Flames hockey. And Matt, did you think we'd be sitting here after this week of hockey looking at a seven-game win streak? Not really, but hey, you can't really complain with any of the results that the Flames have been getting. Let's take a look at the last week of Flames hockey. Um, coming into this week, you expected we'd win two of these, and I expected we'd win all three of them. The first game of the week, Ben Bishop uh, made his LA Kings debut and lost in overtime against the Calgary Flames. This was uh, kind of a weird game, but TJ Brody netted the game-winning goal in overtime, and Brian Elliott made 28 saves to power the Flames to a 2-1 win against the Kings. I was at this game. As, a, as someone who was there, it was really exciting. This was a fun game to watch. The Tanner Pearson goal I thought might deflate the Flames, but they came back after that. Furley's goal. And really played a great game. And that overtime, that was probably the best overtime I've seen in a while. It was a nail-biter, but it was a lot of fun. Oh, for sure. And it was nice to see the Flames buckle down after giving up the opening goal and not let L.A. dictate the play. And Yeah, that was my Mike. worry. I yeah. thought we'd just deflate as soon as the Pearson goal went in. Yeah, then good on Michael Furland for hitting Muzzin and creating that havoc that led to the tying goal in regulation. Well, there's a couple big hits there. I mean, we had the big uh, Giordano hit on um, Dustin Brown as well in the third period. And that was, I think, a bit of a game changer as well. My biggest worry after the Tanner Pearson goal was just the amount of time that the review took. And I think it's getting longer and longer on these video reviews as the season goes on. But I thought it sort of broke the momentum. Like, we were just getting going, and it sort of broke the momentum, gave both teams a bit of a rest. But it really kind of, you know, took us out of the flow of the game. Yeah. I'm still surprised that that goal counted after all of that. It, seeing the replay, you could see that it was Pearson that pitchforked Elliot's pad into the net like I did not think that you were allowed to shove the goalie into the net but apparently that counts now well even after the game when Elliot was asked about it by the media he said you know I'm not really sure what the rule is there but you've got to go with what the ref says so if even the goalie's not sure that tells you that something's wrong yeah a little bizarre but it happens and it didn't cost us so you can't really complain too much no um, in this game, as we expected, Dennis Weidman sat out again, as well as Yerki Yokipaka. And players that I thought looked really good for the Flames in this one. I thought I thought the Versteeg again looked really good. He had one shot on goal, one takeaway, and won fifty percent of his faceoffs. He played fifteen minutes on the ice. Um and I also thought the I mean, we had the 3M line that looked really good, but I also thought that Sam Bennett uh, looked quite good in this game. Sam Bennett has sort of been in and out all season, but I really noticed him doing the right things in this one. Yeah, it seems that the players that were the key contributors to the Flames season last year and the year before that were struggling, TJ Brody, Michael Furland, Sean Monahan, Johnny Gaudreau, Sam Bennett, all of those guys have been struggling pretty mightily this year and both Gaudreau and Monaghan started turning it around in the middle of January. Furland ever since he got put with Gaudreau and Monaghan has been on fire. Ever since Michael Stone came aboard Brody has played like himself and Sam Bennett as you said is starting to round into form as well. Yeah, and you know, speaking of Stone, who you're talking about, he played 21 minutes. He got a lot of ice time. He was the third highest ice time on the blue line. Him and Brody played the most of the pairing, then Giordano Hamilton, and the England Bartowski pairing. Um, Matt, what are your thoughts on this new third pairing of England and Bartowski or Bartkowski? I think it's a fairly decent five-six. 
you always know that England is going to step up his game around this time. He's a proven playoff performer, and whenever the games get more difficult, he rises to the occasion, and seeing the Flames on a seven-game win streak, he is a good portion of that as well, because there's no passengers on the blue line, unlike earlier in the season. I think that, honestly, England is making Bartkowski probably look better than he is right now. Yeah. I don't I think that. I don't think number 44 is a guy who we'll probably see make the team next year. I think with as many young defensemen as we have, somebody has to steal that spot. But it's easy and convenient for Bartkowski to have that spot and leave the young guys in Stockton this year. Well, I, Bartkowski might be the number seven next year just because he's cheap. But, yeah, I think he was more acquired just for we're going to be trading Yoki Paka and we're going to be needing somebody to expose in the expansion draft. So hit, kill two birds with one stone. And speaking of Yoki Paka, on the 28th, the day of this L.A. game, uh, Yoki Paka was also waived by the Calgary Flames. So we all waited with bated breath before the deadline to see what was going to happen with him. Um, Matt, we talked a little bit about the Brody Stone pairing in this game, and we actually have some audio clips that we're going to play from me talking to both these guys in the dressing room after the game uh, about their chemistry with each other and Stone's return to Calgary. So first, let's hear from Michael Stone. So what does it feel like to be back in this building as a member of the Flames instead of his name? It's awesome. Yeah, it's great. I uh, uh, I enjoy going out the, the home side bench here, and, and uh, it's uh Got some good rem- memories here. You, know, you were lucky because you were able to get that sort of um, trade deadline, I guess, jitters out of the way early, being traded a little early. So yeah. now you can just kind of sit down and focus on your game? Yeah, I, I think uh, being traded to a, a city that I'm comfortable with and, and know well helps a lot with that as well. So, um, you know, we're uh, pretty well settled in already and, and uh, things are focusing on hockey. You've been playing a lot of minutes with uh, TJ Brody so far. What do you find about Brody as a partner? He's great. I mean, he uh, um, moves the puck well. He skates himself out of trouble. He doesn't make a whole lot of mistakes. Like it's it makes your job easy. It, absolutely. Anytime you can play with somebody that uh, is that caliber of player, it makes your, your life a whole lot easier. Sure. Thanks. Welcome back to Calgary. And then I asked TJ Brody about his new partner and Michael Stone. TJ, you have a new partner, and how does it feel to have somebody new? What can you tell us about Stone? Yeah, he's a solid player. Um, you know, he's, he's smart. He makes uh, he makes plays, and uh, you know, at the same time, he, he keeps it simple too. And you know, I always know that uh, you know, if I jump up, he's going to be back there for me. And um, you know, I think we're still getting used to each other, but um, you know, I think over time. Once we get to know each other, we'll you know, just keep getting better. When you've had one partner all year and you change partners this late in the season, how hard is that adjustment period? Um, it's just one of those things where you got to, uh, you can't force things, force plays. Um, you know, you got to take what's available out there, and and when it's not, um, you know, sometimes it's better just to stay back and, and read off each other. Thanks, DJ. Yeah. So as you can hear, they both have some really complimentary things to say about each other, which is great. I mean, you know, Brody has a new partner. He's played most of the year with Weidman, and it sounds like he's really enjoying his time with Stone. Well, it also helps going from somebody that is a defensive liability to somebody who actually knows how to play defense effectively. For sure. And as you mentioned at the, you know, the top of this show, I really think that TJ Brody is getting to be himself again. We're getting to see who TJ Brody is and he's not having a lug wideman around. No, and he's not afraid to jump up into the play and contribute offensively. I think he has like two or three goals in the last like five or six games and just he's playing a lot more like the TJ Brody we've come to know over the past handful of years. So the acquisition of Stone right there is worth the third round pick just for uh, seeing Brody turn his game around. Well, and Brody mentioned that to me in the interview as he said that he feels more comfortable that he can jump up because he knows that Stone has the blue line covered. So, you know, that I think is a big part of Brody's game is he has that offensive touch to him, and he needs a partner who he knows has got the the blue line covered. Well, Matt, let's jump to the next game. This was another overtime game, and Michael Backlund scored the overtime winner in this one. Uh, The Red Wings and the Flames were tied late in regulation, and... The Flames ended up winning this one in what I thought was a decent game. I didn't think the Flames played as good as they did against L.A., 
But I thought, you know, obviously they played well enough to get the job done. But what were your thoughts on this one? Well, I thought they pretty much thumped Detroit in the first period and then stopped playing at that point. And it, it seemed like after the first intermission, it's like, okay, we got these guys. And Detroit just kept buzzing and trying to get something going, and they couldn't, and they couldn't, and they couldn't until the very last second of the game when they found the equalizer. And that's got to be a lesson for the Flames. that, like, Even if a team is terrible like Detroit is this season, you can't take them lightly. Because, you know, they are NHL players. They're going to try to have some pride, even if they're going to be drafting in the top five likely this year. They're still an NHL team. They're not the Edmonton Oilers of years gone by where you don't even have to show up and you'll get the two points. So... It's one of those situations that, especially with the upcoming schedule where Calgary is playing mostly elite teams, they need to have 60-minute efforts. They can't just sit back and say, oh, well, we got this one in the bag. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think what you mentioned about them playing the first 20 minutes and maybe you know, tapering off after that is definitely true. And you can't be doing that going forward. I mean, that's not how you're going to win and keep a playoff spot. You've got to be able to keep, even if not the same pressure as the first period, you have to be able to keep consistent pressure on for all 60 minutes because this one could have easily run away from us if Detroit would have, you know, gone on a bit of a hot streak at the end. But I think as we've seen a lot lately, Brian Elliott, I think, really kept the flames in this one. Yeah, and a lot of Flames fans have complained that, oh, the goalies haven't really stolen us any games this year. Well, that's changing, and the real Brian Elliott, the guy that we spent the second round pick at the draft last year to get, is actually playing in the net for Calgary, and now we have a legitimate good starting goaltender in between the pipes, so... Flames fans don't have to worry about, oh, is the goalie going to be okay (laughs) enough for us to get two points? You can see that he's going to make a good save and not have to be concerned about every single shot heading his way. The Elliott that we saw up until, I'd say, mid-January really didn't look like he was worth that second-round pick. But now seeing how Elliott's sort of, you know, straightening out this year... I would be very excited to bring him back next year, and I think right now we're getting a better value than what we paid for him. Yeah, and that's, like, we've had discussions before, and, like, I even said that, like, I don't know which of the guys to bring back, both none of the above or just one, because of the fact that there just wasn't enough information, and you didn't know if Johnson was going to continue his hot streak, which he hasn't really or if Elliot was going to be able to rebound, and he has. So as of now, probably it would be best just to keep both for simplicity's sake, because you know what you have, and go from there. And each, I'm sure that Elliot wants to have a bounce-back season where he doesn't have the first few months like he did this year. Yeah, I think right now, if it was me, I would keep Elliot and maybe let Johnson go to July 1, see what else is out there, and then offer him a contract after that. I just don't want to get complacent if there might be something better. Oh, of course, but usually we'll have that figured out before July 1st, especially now that you can talk to people beforehand without getting That's fined. True. So That's true. So, yeah, I mean, a a Red Wings game that I think we're lucky to sneak away with a win in. Um, And then the third game of the week was one that I was a little bit worried going into. This is a matinee game. The Flames generally don't play well in matinee games. But they came out strong, and there was four Flames scored in the first period of this one. All five goals came from different Flames. The Flames thumped the Islanders 5-2 to in a 2 p.m. game here at the Dome. Yeah, you got to figure that this had a lot stacked up against us. It was a Sunday afternoon game against an Eastern Conference opponent, and the New York Islanders won five games in a row coming in, and they beat the Flames in each of the last five times that we've played them. So it wasn't looking like it was going to be a good one, and 
well, that last five minutes of the first period was fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it was awesome. And looking at the guys who scored, I mean, Michael Froelich, TJ Brody, Michael Furlan, Sean Monaghan, Monty needs a goal. Versteeg got his 12th goal of the year. Like, it's all the players who sort of need to be scoring right now. Minus Johnny Goudreau, who did get an assist. He got his 31st assist of the year on uh, Monaghan's goal. But all the guys that really need to be scoring are scoring, which is awesome. Yeah, and it, you know, it's a weird period when f a four nothing score is actually complimentary of the goaltender. Like Grice was great in the first fifteen minutes, so it could have easily been seven or eight nothing had he not been as good to start the game. Yeah, and this was a game I think that the Flames really needed. It wasn't an overtime win. It was a regulation win, a big regulation win. And I think going into the toughest part of their schedule going forward, um, you know, this is going to put them in good spirits for the three-day break and I think set them on their right foot. Yeah, and they did allow that one goal to Tavares. And, yeah, I was a little worried about that like are they gonna allow the next goal or the next one after that and like is this gonna be like a repeat of the nashville game from a couple weeks ago but they settled it down and they started pressing again against the islanders and eventually took the 5-2 lead after hosang nailed hamannick in the flame zone allowing a three on one and like it, after that, it was like okay, the Flames definitely have it in the bag, and then they just played out the clock. Elliot did allow a little bit of a soft goal to Chimera, but it happens. <laughs> but you know, you you mentioned a good point there. Is they played out the clock? I thought clock management in the third was really good. This team sort of started to shut things down and play a lot more conservatively, and they managed that clock very well. Where sometimes we've seen when they're down they're trying to add a goal or two and it ends up getting them in trouble mm -hmm. and at least they were being more methodical which is something that they have not been doing with any consistency over the past well decade or so really so <laughs> it's been a while and at least now like if they can continue to play like that especially when they're playing against elite teams on a regular basis, it will allow them to be able to shut the other teams down, especially if they do get a one-goal lead in a playoff series. They need to know how to manage the game so that way they're not going to get burned. For sure. Um, I, I really can't look at anything in this game and really give any constructive criticism or constructive feedback to the flames i thought that for what it was the flames did a very good job yeah uh, there's no complaints really they they handled the pushback that the islanders were obviously going to give they didn't need to go and do any risky plays to get like the sixth goal or anything like that they just handled the game well and you know, didn't squander the lead like they did against Nashville. They just played calmly and collected and, okay, we're going to just manage this one and win it, and no big deal. And they did, and it was a good effort from them. And the Flames have had a heck of an effort since their coach called them out as being soft in January. The Flames now have a season-high nine straight games where they have at least one point. They're 8 0 oh, 1 and are 12 2 and 1 in the past 15 games. If we take a look at where that puts them right now, the Calgary Flames currently have 76 points. They're the first wild card in the West, tied with Anaheim, um, who have one game in hand. And next below us is St. Louis at 69 points, who hold the second wild card spot. So, Matt, I mean, there's been times when we've been looking at what's it going to take us to claw into that second wild spot. And right now, if you look at this team, we're looking at this as, you know what, we could surpass Edmonton right now. And if the Flames get lucky, they could potentially, if they keep it up, they could steal the division too. It's not entirely out of reach. They're only seven points back of the Sharks. Stranger things have happened. We've made up ten points in the last month. So it's, you know, stranger things have happened. And that it's 
amazing to see that like the, they are tied with Anaheim for the tenth best record in the NHL, two points behind Edmonton. Who knows? We might end up having home ice advantage in the playoffs. Like, I don't think anybody would have thought that in January. No, I mean we've had sort of a rotten up and down year this year, and even to be where we are, let's enjoy this. Yeah, and like since uh, the middle of November when the Flames were having the their fun start to the season, the Flames actually have the seventh best record in the entire NHL over that stretch. So, you know, that's a credit to the team. Like, it, we do have a genuinely good team. It's just now we're heading into another difficult stretch of games where uh, the whole stretch from thursday march 9th right through the end of the season not only are the flames playing every other day but most of the games are against either playoff teams or teams that are very close in the hunt like los angeles so man in order to get a seven game win streak i mean that's an impressive streak and if you look at the nhl currently we're tied with i believe chicago is the only teams that have a seven game win streak i mean that's impressive any year but what do you think has changed recently for the flames to go on that kind of a run uh, I'm going to be unfair to one member of the Flames, but uh, not having Dennis Weidman in the lineup, it has, uh, it's not just him. Like, removing him and replacing him with Stone was part of the, what's changed. But that trade also was basically a trade getting a top pairing defenseman at the same time. Because TJ Brody went from being borderline terrible this season to being the usual first pairing defenseman that we've been seeing over the past handful of years. So not only did we get a number one, number two defenseman, but we also got a good number four, both at the same time. And that just solidified everything on the defense core. And the Flames have been extremely stingy surrendering offensive zone chances which again leads to fewer goals against and more wins so you're saying if they would have benched Weidman earlier they would have had greater success well they would have needed a quality replacement I don't think like if you would have subbed Kulak in or say Shillington or whomever I don't think it would have had that good of an impact because Brody still would have been trying to cover for the other guy but having stone there who's a legitimate number four it's a win-win for me i think the biggest thing i've noticed uh being in the dressing room after the la game and just looking around at this team is it seems like everybody's buying in it seems like everyone's believing in the coach's system they're playing the way they need to and everyone understands their role on this team now i mean we're starting to see guys like monahan and goudreau starting to pick things up i think it's just that mental aspect that everyone believes you know what this team can do this yeah, and Calgary does have the depth up front to be a quality playoff team. It's just, for whatever reason, a number of the players have struggled for most of the season. Monaghan, Goudreau, Bennett, Brower. So those guys are starting to come around, though. And like if you look at the Flames' fourth line like with... Uh, Boma, Stajan, and either Chason or Brower, because they've changed at times. Like, that's a really good fourth line. And then, like, as you proceed up the lineup, like, there's not really too many holes at any point in the lineup. And with Michael Furland being a legitimate option on the first line, that's, like, a good deadline acquisition right there. So, it, it'll be remain to be seen if they can continue that but if they can like i remember a handful of years ago like when minnesota had that one year where like they just like from january on were unbeatable and like i'm kind of having that same feeling about calgary right now where like you just can't beat them and they the wild did have success in the postseason that year so Maybe Calgary, if they can continue with all of these parts working well together, maybe they can just steamroll the last 16 games and massacre whomever they end up facing in the first round. Well, and you bring up a good point. I mean, you're talking about 
um, you know, the unbeatable team. And we're not going to go 16-0 and from here on in. There's going to be a time when we're going to lose. We all know it's coming. It doesn't have to be a bad loss. It doesn't have to mean that we go on a funk. But often we see that. This team will go on a bit of a win streak. They'll lose one, and then they'll be in a funk, and they'll lose three or four after that. So what do we have to do right now to stay in the hunt when that inevitable loss does come? What do we do to make sure that we're still in the hunt and we don't you know, let this playoff spot fall out of our grasp? Well, that's the key there. They have cycled four lines like especially in the i do believe the islanders game like they were playing the fourth line for like 12 13 minutes in that game so like it just having that ability to roll the fourth li four lines it, it keeps everybody fresh like you don't need to rely on goudreau and monahan exclusively otherwise we're screwed and we're not going to win if they're not scoring so if you got a little bit of offense coming from everywhere, then you can manage the ice a lot better because you're not ha like each shift you're not having to rely on, oh, we need to score a goal here, otherwise we're screwed. So we can just like if we just have a good momentum shift, we can just roll that on and the next guys can come out and keep pushing and pushing and maybe generate some scoring chances and that's one thing that i see has changed in recent months is that they're not focusing in as individuals as much like if gaudreau's having a bad game the flames aren't going to lose that game because he's having a bad game like other guys are stepping in and it whether it's guys on the blue line guys up front the goaltender making good saves like, everybody is buying in, and for the Flames, if they do lose games, and when they lose games, it they need to keep that everybody pulling in the same direction to their game as they have been in recent weeks. Yeah, I was going to echo something very similar. I was going to say, I think it's the belief. I think right now, if you, you're going to lose at some point. But I think that it, you have to say, you know what, we believe in this system, we believe in each other, we believe in the guys and the team. And yeah, maybe we, we're down one or we lost one that we wish we hadn't lost, but you know what, we'll snap back next time and as long as everyone plays their game, we know that eventually we're going to get that win again. And I think when we've seen the big losing streak this year, it's because guys get out of their heads. It's the guys who you know start to play differently or start to give up. And as long as they're, <clears throat> they come into these games committed to win, and they're willing to bounce back and say, yeah, we played a bad game, but we'll do it better next time. And legitimately mean it, because we've heard that a lot this season. No, we got to play better. we got to play better. And they didn't. I think that as long as everyone's buying into the system and believing in each other, they're going to be fine. Yeah, and evidence of that is uh, when uh, the Flames were trailing L.A. after one period, the coach... He said to the team, like, you guys are better than them in the standings. Let's go and show them why. And that belief of, yeah, we're better than these guys. Let's go kick their ass. Well, they need that almost, like, self-arrogance of, yeah, we're the best guys on the ice. Let's go kick their butt and win this game. And as long as they have that demeanor of, we're going to win regardless of who we're playing. They'll win more than they're going to lose. Yeah, I mean, looking at our schedule going forward, we're not always going to be the best guys in the ice. But I think if you go in with that mentality, you know what? We are sitting in a playoff position. We are a good hockey team. And as long as we play our game, we can win. I mean, I, there's no game I look at from here on out this season besides the game at the Honda Center where I say we're not gonna, we can't win it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Like, you know, seriously, there's no game I look at and say, we can't win this one. So I think if you go in with that mentality, you're going to be fine. But everyone needs to go in with the right mental state. I think that's all it is at this point. It's mental. We know we have the right skills and the right people in the right positions on the on the lineup. We just need to go in with the right mental state. I'm calling it now. That curse ends this year. You called it last year, Matt. I know, but this time it's going to happen. All right, well, that's April 2nd. we got a few weeks to go. We'll talk about it as we get closer. Yeah, well, it's going to happen this time. All right, I should, I should hold you to that. I should bet you something. Yeah. 
If anyone has any ideas of what Matt and I should put on the line for this one, tweet us or go on Facebook. Let us know what we should bet on this game because every year Matt says it's going to end, and, and every year it doesn't end. Come on, Calgary. <laughs> let's, just, let's just worry about the month of March before we get to April, all right? Well, especially because Anaheim might be our first-round opponent. I'd like to get that whole storyline put to rest. <laughs> well, we, we can just win the next one in Calgary two days later. No, we're in Calgary first, then we're in Anaheim. So. Oh, you're right. My bad. I had to switch here. Yeah. So so I want that storyline done just in case we end up playing them in the playoffs because, you know, the bad, you know, you don't need any stupid questions hanging in your head. Got enough, got enough crap when you're in a playoff series. You don't need any, oh, we haven't won there in like 10 years or 13 years, whatever. We'll talk about that when we get to that point. I know. I'm just annoyed. Come on. There's nothing think... wrong with that building. Vancouver won there the other day. Come on. <laughs> it's it's a nice building. I've been there. It's a beautiful building. The Flames just don't have any luck there. Matt, I think for the Flames to stay in a playoff spot right now, and you tell me what you think, I think we need to see what we've seen um, a few years ago when the Flames made the playoffs, is that everybody needs to step up and do a little bit more than they usually do. I mean... If you remember, we brought Michael Furland in that year for the first time, and he really stepped up and got better offensive numbers than we expected. Like, I think for us to make the playoffs, I'm not saying everybody needs to play like a first-line player, but everyone just needs to do that a little bit more. Yeah, and you're starting to see that with other guys that have been struggling starting to perform better. Like, for Stieg, he's playing his best hockey in a while. Uh, Kachuk's elevate elevated his game so you know it we'll see how it continues but like guys have been stepping up Derek England which we mentioned earlier he's doing well so we'll see and the Flames magic number for the postseason is only 13.5 so a combination of Flames wins and uh, losses by the ninth place team yeah, and I mean, I don't know. To me, I still always look at it as a baseline 90 points to make the postseason. That's Thereabouts. Always, yeah. yeah, that's always kind of been the baseline. So we're 14 points out of that. So that's seven wins from here on in in, what, 16 games? Yeah, seven and nine. So we pretty much need to win half of them. Yeah. And, again, very doable looking at the schedule. It's, uh, you know, it's a tough schedule, but if they keep playing the way they have been, very doable. Yep. I think one of the things we saw this week that the Flames can't be doing is they can't be giving up. I mean, one was to L.A., which hurt. Uh, one was to Detroit, but we can't be giving up that overtime point. If we're going to make the playoffs, we have to be beating, especially our Western Conference opponents, uh, we have to be beating them in regulation. Well, it also depends on the opponent. Like, we do play L.A. three more times, so obviously don't want to give up loser points to them, but... You know, like, if we're playing irrelevant teams, then, like, say Winnipeg, like, if it goes to overtime, is that really going to make a difference? Not really. So, you know, it all it also depends on who we're playing. Like, it, Yeah, Winnipeg's it, only three points out of a playoff spot right now. Yeah, I know, but we got ten points on them, eleven points, something like that, so... Yeah, I guess that's true. They're kind of irrelevant to us. Like, there's just not enough time for a team like that to catch us. So, Matt, looking at the standings right now, if we look at the teams that are currently in the playoffs in the Western Conference, we have Minnesota, Chicago, Nashville, San Jose, Edmonton, Anaheim, and then the wild card is Calgary, St. Louis. If the Flames do make the playoffs, which of those teams is your ideal um, your ideal opponent for round one? I'm going to go with the San Jose Sharks. The really? reason The reason being is that Calgary is built very very much in the same way that the Pittsburgh Penguins are, and we saw how they handled them. So it, we're a fast team. We have the same system as at Pittsburgh because the Sullivan and Galutzen were assistant coaches together. So, it, yeah, that would be my ideal opponent, which would mean us getting the first wild card spot, which coincidentally we're in. Yeah, I'm. I don't know. I'm not convinced in a seven game series, San Jose is going to be our best opponent. I think that they're, they're the most beatable opponent. So I don't know. I'm going to go a different way. I think the most beatable opponent, even though we've struggled against so far, is the Edmonton Oilers. 
we've had our struggles in the in the regular season against them, but we've had struggles generally in the regular season. I think by the time we get to the end of our 82 games, Talbot was going to be tired. Um, he's not going to be the goaltender he has been all year. I think that McDavid is going to be tired. I think if you can take McDavid out, you've got a chance because they've still got no defense. They've still got no wing depth. It's really their centers that are putting that team together. Yeah, and that's the X factor there is Connor McDavid and Cam Talbot. And sometimes you only need a good goalie and a good forward to win a playoff series. So, like, there's nobody on San Jose that truly scares me. Like, even the goalies, he's good, but not really. And Anaheim, their goaltending is kind of terrible this year, so... But again, with Anaheim, you've got the whole Honda Center factor. Well, that's why I want them to win on April 4th. Get that out of the way. <laughs> Watch them, Matt. They're going to win on the 4th, and then they're going to lose all the ones in the playoffs in the yeah. Honda Center again. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Just because. But, um, yeah, and realistically, like the only other opponent that they can face is uh, either Minnesota or Chicago. And if I had to pick one of those two, it would be Chicago just because of Dubnik. Yeah, see, I don't think Chicago's looked all that great this year, but I think they've had great goaltending from Crawford. Yeah, I just think that Dubnik's a better goaltender than Crawford. So, And Chicago does have the star power, but it, their depth kind of sucks. Like, if I had to pick one of the two to face, it would be Chicago, but it would not be my first pick on either count. So No, mine neither. If we can climb in the standings a bit, I actually think we could do very well against the St. Louis Blues. They've had some, they just haven't been putting things together this year. They've got some lackluster goaltending. They got rid of their biggest defenseman at the deadline. I think they might be ripe for the picking. Well, uh, realistically, the Flames couldn't play them. Even, like, even if the Flames won the division, we'd be playing the first wild card spot because we'd have to catch either Minnesota or Chicago, and that's not happening. So we're gonna play the second wild card team if or the first wild card team if we're first in the Pacific. So we'd basically be playing either Anaheim or Edmonton. Yeah, I, I don't know. I still think Edmonton's the most ideal opponent. I just think they're gonna be worn down and they're not a team I don't think that's built for the playoffs. No, neither do I. Like like I honestly don't see Edmonton advancing past round one, but they're the that McDavid wild card is just like when you have the best player in the NHL, like sometimes that's enough. And you know, I'd rather face somebody that doesn't have a McDavid. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm um I'm not convinced McDavid alone is going to do anything. No, I mean he's good. Like, he doesn't uh, have a puck like, in your uh, net. But if the Flames play the way they are now, I wish we still had an Edmonton game coming up. Yeah, but I think if we played Edmonton again the way we're playing now, we'd have a very different result. Yeah, probably. But like uh, honestly, I think like if the Flames did match up against Edmonton, the the favorite in the series would be Calgary. It's just that one gives me the most nerves, and especially I don't want to hear Edmonton fans gloating all summer. Please, no. <laughs> I, I also think that, and, and I don't want to say you should take a player out because I never want to say that, but I think that Calgary plays a much more physical game than Edmonton, and I think you can throw some of their top centers off by hitting them a little bit more than they're used to. And I think if we start pounding some of those guys into the boards, you're going to see them play a different game, especially if it's you know four or five, six or seven games in a row. Yeah, and um, fans that have been complaining about Troy Brower this season – just wait until uh, game one of the postseason, and you'll understand his value because he does hit and a lot, and he's a pain in the ass in the playoffs. That's when we'll see Brower power. Yeah. So he's much like Furland that one year where, you know, he kind of got under Vancouver's skin a bit. So I'm going to sell t-shirts say that, Brower power. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, and... Like, imagining a playoff series where you've got guys like Stone, England, Kachuk, Furland, Boma, call Hathaway up just because, why not? <laughs> and Brower all throwing massive checks all the time. Like, that'll wear them out really quick, regardless of who we're playing. 
Plus, uh, another reason why I'd like to play the Sharks, though, is because of the fact that they're an older team. So the physicality would stand more likely to wear them down. See, and the Sharks choke sometime every playoff. Yeah. And, I don't know, you, you almost want to take them on hoping it's going to be against you, but if it's not, they generally run right through you. Yeah. I just, I'm not scared of how San Jose is built. Like, they do have skill, of course, obviously. Cause Their skill's old, and they don't have the right goaltending. Mm -hmm. Martin Jones is a good goalie. I'm not convinced he's a number one. Aaron Dell's the backup, and I think he's like what we saw here in Calgary a lot. It's the next guy in line for, you know, the backup role. McElhenney, basically. McElhenney or uh, Carlson or any number of guys that came through at that time. Yeah. So, yeah, I can see the Sharks. I think the Sharks are going to be a bit more of a challenge than Edmonton will, and I also like the idea of a Battle of Alberta in the playoffs again. Oh, so do I. It's just That one gives me slightly more nerves than going up against the Sharks. I'd honestly like to play the, the Oilers in the first round because I don't know if we'll make it to the second round, but if we do, I think ultimately Edmonton would be a better second-round opponent. I think Edmonton's a better opponent the deeper you get. If we can win and Edmonton can somehow win, I think we'd have their number in the second. Yeah. Let somebody else beat them up and we'll take them from there. Well, put it this way. I think if Calgary wins the first round against whomever, I think they could actually go to the conference finals, regardless of who they're playing. Yeah, I don't know. I'm a little afraid of Minnesota, but... Other than that, well, I think... that's the conference finals. That's who they likely match up against is Minnesota or Chicago then, but... Yeah, there's always one upset, and I think one of those teams will be upset early. Same, and I think it'll be Chicago. You could be right. Well, before we talk about playoffs, let's look back at the other milestone that just uh, happened, and that was the trade deadline. And Matt, you and I set this up last week, and it was a pretty quiet deadline. If you look overall, not a lot of moves that happened. Well, it makes sense because of the fact that with the incoming franchise in Las Vegas, everybody's worried about the expansion draft, and like I wouldn't want to spend assets if I'm not going to keep the guy, so it, that stymied a lot of action. Well, I think outside of that, too, I mean, especially in the West, you've got teams that are so close together, there were very few real buyers or sellers true and if you look at the teams that did buy and sell i think that you know everyone had to give something to get something and i didn't look at any team that really unloaded i mean even colorado didn't really unload and they're definitely a seller yeah well yeah colorado doesn't have any or very many pieces that are sellable and like it, where you're gonna get the maximum value right now like, honestly, like, Landis, Cog, and Duchesne are 26 and 24. Like, there's no rush to get rid of either guy. And this draft being somewhat terrible, like, in the 99 draft or 96 draft level of mediocrity, like, draft picks this year, like, there's a reason why the Flames don't have a second or third now, because uh, whomever we picked up, stone and lazar like it, those guys are going to be better than those two picks even if they're only marginal depth players for the flames just because this draft is legitimately terrible <laughs> so like there's no reason for like a team like colorado to trade for a, a, like a 20th overall pick from some team that wants duchene i think we're going to see the majority of the moves that we'd usually see the deadline that aren't rental deals made at the draft after the the uh, expansion draft is completed i agree like i i could see duchene and landis cog moving then where the primary pieces coming back are like 2018 draft picks plus whatever so well let's talk about the one move the calgary flames made we waited with bated breath all day for the flames to do something and the flames deal came in pretty much right near the deadline the Calgary Flames trade with an unusual trade partner, the Ottawa Senators. I can't remember the last time we made a deal with the Sens. Can you? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Chase on for uh, Seal off earlier this season. Oh, there you go. Okay. So we are 
familiar bedfellows. And the Calgary Flames gave up Yerky Oki Paka, who just hours earlier had cleared waivers, and a 2017 second round draft pick in exchange for forward Curtis Lazar and defenseman Mike Kostka. And Mike Kostka was immediately assigned to the Stockton Heat, where he is now wearing jersey number uh, 22. And Curtis Lazar has yet to play a game for the Flames, but he's, he'll be wearing number 20 after his previous number 27 is worn by Dougie Hamilton here. So, Matt, uh, why don't we get your initial thoughts on this deal? Initially, seeing a second-round pick being traded is always like, oh, that's not good. It's very Sutter-esque. <laughs> yeah, but looking at the draft more deeply, like, it, in a normal year, like, that would be, like, say, like, last year's draft, you're talking about a 95th to 120th overall pick, so, like, a fourth-round pick. That's how bad this particular draft is. Like, outside of the top five, it's scary bad. <laughs> so, like, it, there probably will be a handful of guys that are decent out of the draft, but it's going to be a lot more difficult than usual. So, getting a guy that was drafted in the first round and has been a quality third, fourth line forward is a good thing. He's only 21. He's a right winger, which obviously helps. He's a center too, but... A right shooting right winger. Yeah, it, which that helps organizationally. And personality-wise, he's very much like Craig Conroy. So that's what the team needs is guys to keep the room loose and that that is important and with him only being 21 he fits right in the that grouping of the leadership on the team and i think that lazar will end up being like the third fourth line kind of like a stefan yell ish role player type like i don't see him being a 30 40 point player for the flames but just that depth guy that can be a pain to play against. And he's not a skinny player by any means, so it it helps. And like any other year, a second-round pick for Lazar would have been a massive overpayment, but this year, not so much. And... It is what it is. Like I mean, I, if we like, break this down into sort of two trades, the second for Lazar and uh, Yogi Packer for Kostka, I think that we win on both fronts. I Yogi Packer, uh, he played well last year, and you have expectations of, okay, he played a reasonable level. You expect him to do it again, and he didn't. And... Kulak played just as well. Watherspoon played just as well. Bartkowski's played just as well. Well, you can find any of those guys. They're bargain basement guys, and Bartkowski's making a lot less than Yoki Paka, so it saves a bit of money on the cap. And so what, basically? Well, I, th I think going forward, too, Lazar and Koska. I mean, Koska more than Lazar, but let's start with Koska. I think Koska gives us what Bartkowski was supposed to give us. He gives us a veteran presence on the blue line in Stockton. So the Flames need right then now. They have a lot of kids down there. They have a lot of guys who, you know, need probably some leadership, and we don't have that Aaron Johnson type down there this year. So I think that's Koska's role. I don't expect to ever see him playing for the Flames, but I think he'll be around the organization for a few years. Lazar, for those that don't know, he's a 22-year-old. He was born February 2nd, 1995. He's six foot, 209 pounds. He plays center and right wing, shoots right. He was drafted 17th overall in 2013. To me, when I look back at, at Lazar when he played for the Edmonton Oil Kings, he had some good potential, and I think this is a kid who got rushed to the NHL. I've talked to you before about how I don't think a player should ever move from junior or very few times ever go from junior right to the NHL. I think here's a great example of a kid who probably could have used some AHL seasoning. Um, but I like the deal. Like you said, I think we've got a second, maybe second line, maybe, but definitely a third line center. I think he's a kid who will be around. I think he's really sort of your next 
Lance Bowman, that guy who's good to have around, cheap to keep here, and likes to be in Calgary. And I think from what I've seen so far, one of the most impressive stats I've seen from Lazar is his ability to talk to the media. For a 22-year-old, you compare him to Conroy, I think he's a fantastic interview. Yeah, and that's important just for keeping the room light, especially... Like, in the playoffs when, like, everybody's a little bit on edge. Like, you need somebody just to keep everybody loose a bit. So, like, you, your nerves aren't, like, you're not freaking out, basically. And it sounds silly, but it, that is important. And I'm hoping that he, as he's working out with the team, trying to learn the flame system, that... He can start to rebound from a bad season. He had mono at the beginning of the season, so he lost a lot of weight. And that's the reason for his downturn in stats. And, uh, like, I, like I don't expect him to have a great end to the year, particularly. Like, I don't see him stepping in and being, like, an amazing third-line forward for this team. But he'll be there. And... Yeah, you know, he'll contribute when it's he gets the opportunity, and next year when he's able to start fresh and have a good off season of training, then he should be fine to rebound physically from his ailment. I think you're right, Matt. I think that um, Lazar is a prime candidate for a bounce back season next year. Like you said, he had mono that really affected him at the beginning of the season. He didn't really get the the full training camp he only played 33 games for ottawa so far this year and he has one assist in and one total point so i think that if you bring him in you get him acquainted with this team and you bring him back next year i think he's gonna have a lot to prove and i would not be surprised to see him come out and look really good after a summer of rest yeah uh, like i'm expecting him to be basically taking chase on spot on the team more or Put less, on. like the third, fourth line right winger. I could even see the team trying him out on the first line. Um, I I have to think that when he's playing his best, he's going to be better than Furland. And just looking at his play style, I think there might be some chemistry there with him and Johnny and Monty. I don't think he's a bona fide right winger, but until we get one, I think he might be a better option than Furland. Well... All those kind of things will sort themselves out in time. Like, Furlan's on a hot streak right now. Does that continue indefinitely, or is this just a temporary thing? Who knows? So we'll just have to wait and see. Like, there's no definite an answer to it. Like, he may end up on the line with Bennett and save Versteeg at some point. Who knows? Yeah, but it's another first-round draft pick on the Flames team. They're starting to collect these first-round picks, both from their organization and others. And I think it's a wise move. Like you said, it's a weak draft year. The draft pick we give up, I don't think is going to amount to much anyways. We'll see. But even if it does, I think sometimes it's better to go with what you know than what you don't. And in a draft year like this year is expected to be, I think maybe that second-round pick turns into something, but maybe it doesn't. And at least with a guy like Lazar, you know what you've got. Yeah. And, like, I've even said on this show before, like, I'm not opposed to trading the Flames' first-round pick this year either. Like, it, the draft is, like, a, if the Flames are, say, picking in the 16 to 18 range, like, honestly, the best player is uh, Adam Foote's son, uh, Kalen, I think. Um, and, like, he's just a defensive defenseman. Like... And, like, that's the best guy that's available there. And it's like, um, this draft sucks. <laughs> so, you know, it, like, that's not, like, he's not one of those six foot seven monsters that you see going in that area. He's just a regular player. But that's how weak the draft is that, like, that's one of the better options is a guy who eventually, if he works out, might be Derek England. It's like, yay, this draft is not good. So, well, and you, and you mentioned two drafts like this one, 1999 and 1996. And if we look back at the top 10 picks in those drafts, um, if we look at the 96 draft, the top 10 picks, Chris Phillips, Andre Zuzan, Jean-Pierre Dumont, Alexander Volchenkov, Rick Jackman, Boyd Devereaux, Eric Rasmussen, Jonathan Atkin, 
Rusalai Saleh, and Lance Ward. So, I mean, of that whole top 10, Phillips is probably the only guy that did anything. Yeah. A lot of these guys, like Jackman, was around forever, but he never mounted anything. Yeah, or Zuzan, he was around forever, but he never did Didn't he did play anything. here? Yeah, he did. But, I like, he, he never amounted to anything, like, his potential. Like, everybody kind of sucked. J.P. Dumont was the only good forward in the top 15. So like, and, and then if if we look at the 99 draft, this is the one where there was a big trading carousel from the Canucks trying to get into the top two so they could draft the Sedins. And if we look, we have Patrick Stefan. There was a big um, bust of a pick. Daniel Sedin, Henrik Sedin, Pavel Brendel, Tim Connolly, Brian Finley, Chris Beach, Taylor Pyatt, Jamie Lundmark, Branislav Mezzi, Oleg Saprikin. Like, those are the top 11 picks. Our pick was Saprikin. That's another terrible year. Yeah. Yeah, like, this year, Nolan Patrick should be good. And after that, it's like, um, yeah, not a lot. <laughs> it, like, uh, one of the guys, uh, Lilligren, uh, he was supposed to be the second overall pick. And, like, scouts have him rated either in the top five or like 40th and it's like um that's not good <laughs> so you know it, basically another guy that's like um shillington like very good offensive potential but kind of lost defensively and yeah yeah so, i mean like for it, me but that's where you've got like uh such a weak draft where that guy is still rated in the top five even though some scouts like would have him rated in the 40s somewhere like it it's just not a very good year so i think for me when i sum it up i think the lazar trade is good it gives us another asset we know what we've got i think it's an asset we'll be able to sign cheap in the off season because he has a had a bad year and I think it's a guy that he's not necessarily going to be our number one scorer, our number one playmaker, but I think it's an asset that is going to do good things for the Flames. And I think a good veteran guy and a good depth guy, um, I, he's not a veteran yet, but I think he'll sort of mature into a veteran here. And I think a good depth player. And if you look at a lot of the teams like us in the standings or the teams we want to be, they have those guys. They have those young players who are really their you know, depth long-term guys and i think that's what lazar is going to turn into yeah and everybody that wins the stanley cup always has good players up and down the lineup and and most of them are young yeah and lazar he's not going to be an expensive player for a number of years so that'll be a good cap saver type move especially if he does emerge into being a better player yeah, and he has familiarity with Dave Cameron, which is probably how he got here. Um, so, you know, I th I think it's a good move, and we'll see what happens and when Lazar actually gets in and what he looks like. But I don't see any downside to this for what we gave up. I mean, if it doesn't work out, you let him go in the offseason. You just don't tender him. Yeah, well, we're going to keep him around for a while. You just, like, if down the road he's not very good, you either wave him or trade him. You'll, you'll sign him to one more contract, probably a two- or three-year deal, and then you'll assess it after that. Yeah. So, Matt, this week was the general manager meetings in Boca Raton, Florida, where the NHL GMs get together to discuss the NHL, discuss the way the game's going, and discuss the future of the game. And GMs were asked today on the first day of the meetings uh, to start thinking big picture, to look at the game overall and maybe make some big changes to it. And I don't know about you, but there's a few things that were interesting to me that have come out of the GM meetings. I thought I'd run them by you and see your thoughts. I've never been a fan of this loser point appearing from nowhere in the NHL. I'm not a fan of the three-point game, but I think that if they're going to do it, there's what sounds like a reasonable proposal finally on the table. And Jim, or sorry, Brad Trilliving, the Calgary Flames GM, uh, was in a group, they got into breakout groups, who talked about a three-point regulation win system. And it sounds like what would happen is a win in regulation would get you three points, a win in overtime would get you two, and a win in uh, shootout would get you one, and the loser would always get zero points. And if you're going to do it, to me, that sounds like the way to go, because then, I mean, the loser's not getting a point. Why should the loser ever get a point? Well, 
I I wouldn't be a fan of that. Like a, a three point for a regulation win, fine. Two points for an overtime win or a shootout win, fine. And but it should be one for an o OT loss, regardless, and zero for like a uh, regulation loss. So that way, like each po game is three points. I yeah, I don't know. I. I can kind of like this one. I mean, if you think about the old C system before lockouts, you got what two points, whether you won or lost, but there was a five minute overtime on it. Isn't that the way the old system yeah. used to work? So, I mean, whether you win or lose, you get nothing. I like the idea, or sorry, whether you win, you get points, whether you lose, you get nothing. I like the idea of having the points go down based on what we're playing. Like really the shootout is almost a flip of the coin. So why should you get three points for winning in a shootout? If we're playing three-on-three -three hockey and OT, why should you get the same number of points for winning three-on-three -three if you couldn't get it done five-on-five? Five? Oh, I agree with that. It's just... Like, if it, you're going with a three two one zero system, like, it, you, the OT should be a two for the winner, one for the loser. Like, each game should be three points regardless. Yeah, I can see both ways. I'm just not a fan of rewarding the losers. Yeah. Um, the other thing I thought that came out that was kind of interesting, there's a whole bunch of small things, but I don't know if you read through the notes or not, but the other one I thought was interesting was the idea of allowing a coach's challenge if there's no more timeouts. Right now, the way it works is if you do a coach's challenge and you lose, you forfeit your timeout. And some of the GMs, I guess, said they want the chance to have a second coach's challenge even after that timeout's been forfeited. And the idea was floated that, okay, but if you lose, you'll get a minor penalty, probably for delay of game. What do you think of that one, Matt? Perfectly fine, because the timeout is a necessary thing. And, like, sometimes you use the timeout just to be able to like settle your guys down or whatever and like if you burn that like you can't necessarily do that because oh i might have to challenge something well that would remove that stipulation out of the way so okay yeah you burned your time out but at least this way like if there was an obvious like where the guy's like two feet in the zone but it wasn't called you can still do it and like, I don't think you'd see a ton of coaches' challenges with no timeout remaining, but at least, like, for something blatantly obvious, a, a challenge would be available. See, and, and I would much rather go with a football-type system where you have so many challenges. Um, you know, I agree with you. With only one, I think it's different in football because you have three timeouts per half in the NFL, and you get, what, three challenges per half? So it makes a little, or three timeouts and three challenges, I think. Um, and it makes it a little more fair there, I think. But yeah, with one timeout, I don't want to take away the timeout. I think it'd be perfectly reasonable to say, you know what, each team gets one free challenge a game, maybe. And then after that, it is a two minute delay a game. And I think you'd see a lot more coaches picking and choosing what they're going to challenge. Yeah. And uh, make it reasonable. Yeah. And like how, uh, they they're also discussing like uh with the blue line like your skate has to go completely over the line right now to be on side and now like they're wanting to look at like it if your skate breaks the plane is that good enough that kind of thing so we'll see my question is if there's a challenge that toronto overrides uh, in the war room, does that mean the referee should sit for two minutes for delaying the game? No comment. <laughs> well, I mean, if the teams are going to get it for, you know, challenging, if Toronto challenges their own people, there's got to be some sort of ramification, right? So, I don't know. I like, I think the coach's challenge idea is working out. I think the implementation still needs to be tweaked. I think that the coach's challenge is added to the game, but it needs to be done a lot quicker, too. I'm finding that too often it's just taken far too long to get that challenge and get a ruling on the ice yeah well it's like the uh review and then the challenge for um the pearson goal against los angeles and like first they reviewed it and yeah it was a goal and then you had the challenge and then okay yeah well 
it didn't count or like didn't get overturned but like it's almost like one of the things that they could do in a situation like that was like if it's being reviewed review it from all aspects like even if it takes a little bit longer like okay yeah the puck did cross the line did it go in legally and do both at the same time like okay yeah you can see the pucks over the line make sure it's okay then okay and that way you're getting the full ruling at once so that way it streamlines the process entirely so in a situation like that the coach can't challenge see and i i mean i don't think this has been proposed but i sort of like the idea and this one i've been thinking about is what if if you lose the challenge to have just the timeout evaporating because again it's the nhl making things disappear and appear it goes to your opponent so when you make that challenge, you're pretty much slowing down the game. You're pretty much getting a timeout by challenging. So I think it'd be neat if, okay, hey, you lost. Now your opponent gets your timeout, and now they've got two of them, and they can use it to change the, the tempo of the game. Yeah, that slows down the game, though. So. But there's going to be two of them anyways. I mean, theoretically, there could be two timeouts in any game. It's not like we're adding a timeout that wasn't there. Yeah. You could would, do that. Yeah. I would rather do the minor penalty, but I can't see the GMs being up for a minor penalty for losing a challenge. Yeah, I but. still like the you get a penalty instead. I think yeah, that makes things a little more fair. That's my preference. I just can't see it going over well. Um, and there was some other interesting talk that happened, talking about, say, eliminating the two face-off dots inside the blue line, having one right in the middle, and they were really asked the GMs to blue sky what they thought, you know, the NHL might look like in five years. And some interesting discussion based on that. So if you're interested, go check it out. There's a great clip from the first day. Uh, Mark, I don't know if you saw this, map, but Mark Bergevin, the Montreal Canadiens GM, didn't want to talk to the media. So he walked through the media alley behind a plant. <laughs> he took a plant no, out of the I, hotel. I did and he not held see it that. In- he held it in front of his face and walked through the media alley so nobody would see him. He was supposed to be incognito. Why not? So, I don't know. It's uh, I guess they're having some fun, too. So, yeah, I guess I wanted to ask you, are there any things, I mean, if we're blue sky and like the GMs did, is there anything in five years that you think needs to be changed in the game? Anything longer term that you think the NHL needs to look at? One thing that I would like to see implemented is if you have two icings in one minute, you get a delay of game penalty. So that way, like you, especially like in the last five minutes, you see some teams sitting on a lead, especially if they have good centers, just constantly icing the puck, and it gets a little boring because you're just wasting everybody's time. So two icings in a minute, you get a minor penalty. That's interesting. I never thought of that, but that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah, no, I think that would be good. I think, um, the no touch icing that they put in, I know there's a lot of controversy, but I like that. I know there's some some talk of going back, but I think it's the right thing for the game right now. Yeah. Well, it, it, it does cause an injury about once every 20 years and Pat Peak and Yanni Pitkinen both shattered their heel because of it. So, you know, for a nothing play, like, honestly, how many times a year does somebody beat out a close icing in a situation like that that leads to a goal? Maybe once. Uh, I'd rather err on the side of caution and not have somebody's life being ruined because they shattered their foot. So, you know. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think what I would want to change long term. I know there's a lot of talk about the nets and the pads, and I really want them to leave the goalies the way they are. Um Oh, I I, I think that you could streamline a lot of the goalie stuff. Like, it, it's ridiculous, but... I think you can streamline the pads, but I don't want them to touch the nets. No, just the goalie equipment themselves. Like, if you look back in the 70s and that, at the goaltenders and, like, how thin they are, like, it, yeah, the protection for the equipment is a lot better now, but you know, at a huge cost because, like, you have certain goalies who are not very good, like Jonas Hiller, for example, who made a lot of saves and basically his career was made because he was just covering most of the net via his equipment. So, 
you know, like yeah, I'd rather. I'd be okay with them streamlining the equipment, but I don't want them to touch the nets. I think that really changes the dynamic of the game. Yeah, well, it's not the same game then. Um, the only I don't know. I'm trying to think of what I would like to see. I I think the game's pretty good the way it is right now. Um, yeah, a lot of the changes I would want to see aren't necessarily on ice changes. They're more CBA changes. I've mentioned before. I'd like to see player and team option deals come back, but. I think right now, the way it is on ice, I like the current product. Yeah. So it's just I, mostly minor tweaks. Like, I'd like to see the shootout expanded to five skaters just because it it gives a little bit more drama to it instead of... Okay, so that was another proposal that came out today, and the idea that came out was after the three shooters being allowed to reuse shooters. Uh, right. that That's cheap, because like if you have one guy that's really good, like, say, Thomas Vanek for Detroit and now Florida, he's, like, amazing at shootouts. Well, you just need a ringer then, and, like, that just seems kind of cheap to me. Well, I think there's a way you could do it. Like, they do it in international hockey. And... Oh, I know. And, like, we have saw, like, uh, Taves and I think TJ Oshie where they just keep scoring. Like, th that that gets cheap. Like, But what if you could do it, say, every third shot? Like, the guy can keep shooting, but he can't shoot more than once every three shots. Well, if you have three guys that are good, then you can just massacre the other team and win. Like, it... it it just seems cheap to me. Like, yeah, I, th I think there's a place for it, and I can see why the GMs want it. I mean, we've seen some deep shootouts where you start to get, like, third-pairing defenseman shooting. Well, yeah, and that's part of the fun. Like, it, that Merrick Malik goal in the first year of the shootout would have never happened because, like, seriously, who would put Malik in? At one point, you shoot your backup goaltender. Why not? They have to have some fun, too. <laughs> well, technically, they're a dressed player, right? I mean, if you're going to rotate through the dressed players, you should have to shoot the backup first. Yeah. And I'd love it, to see some backup just score the winning goal. Yeah, like, that'd be awesome. <laughs> you can't take your pads off. You can't take your catcher off. You just got to go out there the way you are and try to score that goal. Yeah, fling it at the net somehow and beat That's the other right. guy. I think it'd be hilarious to watch. And Yeah, I don't know, and I, what, watch some... Uh, back up do the schlemko <laughs> pretty much and, and you know i mean i think the shootout's kind of a joke anyway so why not add the backup goalies to it yeah why not if, if i had my way i'd get rid of the shootout but i know that's not happening um i think the three on three overtime works for right now it's not my preference but i think it works for right now i wouldn't touch that the way it is um so yeah there's not a whole lot i would change besides trying to get rid of loser points somehow and streamline that like, I'm okay if there's a loser point. Like you mentioned, I just don't like a point appearing out of nowhere. Yeah. And realistically, the three two one system, as I described it, would have virtually no impact on the standings anyway. So, like, it's one of those situations where, like, yeah, you can change it to the three two one system, but if the net outfit... That outcome is the same like what's the point yeah uh, now but i think you know down the road we'd see some change i'd be curious to see if there's been a ton of change if we were to model say this season on the old on the old uh point system what it would look like that i think would really be the telling point of take the last how many years we've been using this point system and see how they'd model against the old one and what kind of change we'd get yeah well, Matt, uh, anything else you want to talk Flames about? No, I'm looking forward to the week ahead. Me too. So why don't we talk about that one? We had some interesting predictions for last week. Last week, the Flames played three games. There's six points in the table. I was bold and thought the Flames would sweep the week with six points, beating L.A., Detroit, and the New York Islanders. You thought the Flames wouldn't do as well. Still pretty good, but you thought they'd get four points, beating Detroit and the New York Islanders. So I won the week. Finally, someone's had a move. We haven't had any movement in points since December. So I'm currently leading 6-1. to one. So, Matt, I think uh, you're going to have a hard time catching up with me right now. I pretty much have to nail every week exactly the rest of the way to tie you, I think. Or, I think so. Or close to it, anyway. So it takes the pressure off. I can make some crazy predictions. Maybe I'll predict a half point this week. Oh, go ahead. You go first. All right, so this week the Calgary Flames have a few games. They have a three-day break. The 6th, 7th, and 8th, they're off. Then they're back in the Saddledome for the start of what I'm calling their 
uh, crazy schedule. They play every other day from here until the end of the season. On the 9th, they're at the Dome taking on the Montreal Canadiens. Then they take a quick trip to Winnipeg to take on the Jets in Winnipeg on the 11th. That's a Saturday game at 5 p.m. Mountain Time. And then they're back in Calgary on the 13th to take on the Pittsburgh Penguins at 7 p.m. So if you want to see this team in all its glory right now, go to Tick Ticks on your mobile phone, download their app, and buy some tickets to see Montreal or Pittsburgh. It's a tough week. Uh, two tough teams. I think Winnipeg is a given. Um, I'm debating if I think it's going to be four or six points here. You know what? I'm going to be brazen. I'm going to say that the win streak continues and they get all six points. Wow, you're going for the 10-game win streak. Okay. I got nothing to lose. True. I think they're going to get two points and only going to beat Winnipeg. But they need four, so I'll throw Montreal in the hat, in the ring as well. So... I think of all those teams, Montreal is going to be the toughest. Yeah, I don't see the Flames beating Pittsburgh twice this season, so uh, I'm hopeful, but we'll see. But I'm going to go with Montreal because they want to pay them back for that game that started the whole mess. So Could back be. at the end of January. So nice bookend to that whole stretch, so... We'll see. Let me ask you two roster questions. We've seen Dennis Weidman sitting out the last couple of games. Do you think that in the month of March, we see Weidman slot back into a Flames game? If somebody gets hurt, yes. You think he's a better option than a call-up? Yeah. And he'll be the number six. Um, and they'll be sheltered. Like, whomever of... Like, I'm assuming it won't be Barkowski getting hurt, because in which case, who cares? And you just slot Weidman there. But uh, you'll see whomever gets hurt, like England moving up into the top four and miscellaneous pieces slotting around. So, like, if Giordano gets hurt, Brody goes up with Hamilton and England up with Stone, and you just put Barkowski and Weidman and play him like six minutes a night. <laughs> Barring an injury, do you think that we see Curtis Lazar slot into the lineup this week? I think that Lazar probably won't play till towards the 15th to 20th, unless the Flames go on a losing streak or get somebody gets hurt. I think Lazar will either play when we're out or when we're clinched. Yeah. I, I think with the chemistry you have now, you don't want to add another guy in. I think Stone was different because you sort of had to take a piece, a specific piece off the blue line. Um, but Lazar is just an extra piece. I think he's a good extra, but par barring an injury, I wouldn't try to just slot him in right now. I think if we're out of the playoffs, Lazar goes in and we see a few call-ups, or if we're clinched, Lazar goes in and we let people rest. Yeah, and like it, if somebody's banged up or sick or whatever, then he'll be like the first player in. You think he'd go in first over Freddie Hamilton? Yeah, probably, just because wanting to get him in the lineup. I I think Hamilton he's there. Like I I think they'd want to see what he has given the opportunity. So right now the Flames have three extra players. They have Dennis Wideman, Freddie Hamilton, and Curtis Lazar. And I think um I think you I personally don't think you see Wideman go back in unless there's just no way to get a guy up and with such close uh, games being played, it may not be possible to get someone up in time for Stockton. But I don't know. Um, I I would rather call somebody up at this point than put Weidman in. It also depends on who gets hurt as well. Yeah, and I guess depends if we're clinched or not too. Yeah. But well, we'll see. But I'm I'm hoping it's going to be a good week of Flames hockey, and then after uh, the Pittsburgh game, the Flames have some other good looking games: Boston, Dallas, L.A. They go on the road to take on Washington, Nashville, St. Louis, and then they're back at home for Colorado, L.A., and San Jose to end up the night. So, if you look at this schedule, Matt, this is playoff level hockey. Like this month, we have to play playoff quality hockey to, in order to be able to get even 500. I think. Well, the rest of the season, only the Winnipeg game, the Dallas game, and the Colorado game are against 
teams that are far enough out of the playoffs where they're kind of irrelevant. Uh, Montreal, Pittsburgh, they're both in the top 10. Same with Washington. Boston's, I think, tied for 13th in the NHL. Then you have LA, Nashville, St. Louis that are all right with us in the standings vying for those wild card spots and then in april we play anaheim twice la and san jose so like not a fun schedule by any stretch so like the flames have to be on their toes for the rest of the season in order to make the playoffs and if they can hold their own then that should bode well for whomever they face in round one i think one of the benefits this month too is we have a lot of eastern conference opponents and so if we are going to lose, I'd rather be losing the Eastern Conference teams right now than teams like St. Louis, teams like L.A. who are right on our heels. Yeah. Like those games against Nashville, L.A., and St. Louis, there's five in total of the 16 that are against those teams. They're pretty much all must wins. I, so. I think pretty much every Western Conference game is a must win, either because it's a team that we have to win or it's a team we'd be embarrassed not to win. True. You know, the Winnipeg game, uh, I, I'm uh, kind of neutral on. But, I mean, if we lose against Colorado, that's going to be embarrassing. Um, we have to beat L.A. in both the games this month that we play them. And we play them again once in April. We have to beat Dallas. We have to beat St. Louis. We have to beat Nashville. But, yeah, I, th I think that right now a lot of this, I mean, you've got to beat the West and stay even against the East is the way I'm looking at this. Yeah, and we do have an eight-point cushion, so, like, there you can is afford some a couple flex losses. Yeah, uh, there is some flexibility if things go sideways a bit, but you can't have, like, a five-game losing streak now. No, like, I... You, you, you just can't <laughs> and no, expect to make it. But you can also expect a 16-game win streak from here on out. No, uh, like, uh, what I'm ideally hoping for is a 10-6 and six record. Like, that would be my best-case scenario for the rest of the season. So, like, that's, you know, baking in six losses. So, it's going to be a tough schedule, and hopefully they're close to that. That would give them 96 points to finish the season, by the way. Um, so, if that was the case, the people on Calgary Puck who have been following the snake thread would be pleased. But, um, For yeah. those that don't know, why don't you explain the snake? It's just been a uh, following along the season pace from two years ago when the Flames made the playoffs and last year when they did not, and seeing how like each of the te the where the Flames are at each game throughout the season and seeing how they're doing in relation to each other and the theoretical ninety six point cutoff to make the playoffs. So, yeah, kind of a nerdy hockey thing for those that aren't in it. Looking at this schedule, it's definitely going to be tough. And I think the toughest thing is going to be not having a lot of practice time. Playing every other game, they're not going to get as much practice in. They'll get their morning skates and stuff. But if the team goes off the rails, if something isn't working out, the coach isn't going to have a lot of time to sort of change those things by doing a practice. It's going to be a lot probably of video sessions more than anything, especially when you factor travel into this. Um, so it's, you know, they have to buy in, they have to believe in the system and keep going and not fall off the rails where it's like, now we can't get back on. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, well, it'll be a bit of a marathon, but when you got 16 games in 32 days, it'll set things up for game one, round one, and they'll be used to playing every other day. That's for sure. Well, enjoy the week of Flames Hockey, Matt, and we'll talk to you again after the Flames are done with the Pittsburgh Penguins. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have an awesome week, and take it easy. This has been another Fireside Chat. Don't forget to subscribe to the show at firesidechat.ca. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash firesidechat, and to follow us on Twitter at Fireside Podcast. Catch our show on the podcast channel at thehockeywriters.com. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike License. Hosted by Dan Stevenson and Matt Dubor. Produced and edited by Peter Marino and Ryan Coetz. <laughs>